I want to begin reading at verse 16, which you all know, and read on to some of the verses later that you probably don't know so well. <clears throat> John chapter 3, verse 16, page 121 in the New Testament of the Good News Bible. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. Whoever believes in the Son is not judged, but whoever does not believe has already been judged because he has not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds are evil. Anyone who does evil things hates the light and will not come to the light because he does not want his evil deeds to be shown up. But whoever does what is true comes to the light in order that the light may show that what he did was in obedience to God. After this, Jesus and his disciples went to the province of Judea where he spent some time with them and baptized. John also was baptizing in Enon, not far from Salim, because there was plenty of water in that place. People were going to him and he was baptizing them. This was before John had been put in prison. Some of John's disciples began arguing with a Jew about the matter of ritual washing. So they went to John and said, Teacher, you remember the man who was with you on the east side of the Jordan, the one you spoke about? Well, he is baptizing now and everyone is going to him. John answered, no one can have anything unless God gives it to him. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him. The bridegroom is the one to whom the bride belongs, but the bridegroom's friend who stands by and listens is glad when he hears the bridegroom's voice. This is how my own happiness is made complete. He must become more important while I become less important. He who comes from above is greater than all. He who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks about earthly matters. But he who comes from heaven is above all. He tells what he has seen and heard. Yet no one accepts his message. But whoever accepts his message confirms by this that God is truthful. The one whom God has sent speaks God's words because God gives him the fullness of his spirit. The Father loves his Son and has put everything in his power. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever disobeys the Son will not have life but will remain under God's punishment. For the Bible study for this evening, we are going through the book of Ecclesiastes, and we have reached chapter 5, page 652 in the Good News Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and then I'm going to read Luke's Gospel chapter 16, which has a bearing on what we've read, so you can perhaps have your finger in that passage ready. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, reading from verse 10, where we left off last week. If you love money, you will never be satisfied. If you long to be rich, you will never get all you want. It is useless. The richer you are, the more mouths you must feed. All you gain is the knowledge that you are rich. A working man may or may not have enough to eat, but at least he can get a good night's sleep. A rich man, however, has so much that he stays awake worrying. Here is a terrible thing that I have seen in this world. People save up their money for a time when they may need it and then lose it all in some unlucky deal. 
and end up with nothing left to pass on to their children. We leave this world just as we entered it, with nothing. In spite of all our work, there is nothing we can take with us. It isn't right. We go just as we came. We labor trying to catch the wind, and what do we get? We have to live our lives in darkness and grief, worried, angry, and sick. This is what I have found out. The best thing anyone can do is to eat and drink and enjoy what he has worked for during the short life that God has given him. This is man's fate. If God gives a man wealth and property and lets him enjoy them, he should be grateful and enjoy what he has worked for. It is a gift from God. Since God has allowed him to be happy, he will not worry too much about how short life is. I have noticed that in this world a serious injustice is done. God will give someone wealth, honor, and property, yes, everything he wants, but then will not let him enjoy it. Some stranger will enjoy it instead. It is useless and it's all wrong. A man may have a hundred children and live a long time, but no matter how long he lives, if he does not get his share of happiness and does not receive a decent burial, then I say that a baby born dead is better off. It does that baby no good to be born. It disappears into darkness where it is forgotten. It never sees the light of day or knows what life is like, but at least it has found rest, more so than the man who never enjoys life, though he may live 2,000 years. After all, both of them are going to the same place. A man does all his work just to get something to eat, but he never has enough. How is a wise man better off than a fool? What good does it do a poor man to know how to face life? It is useless. It is like chasing the wind. It is better to be satisfied with what you have than to be always wanting something else. Everything that happens was already determined long ago. And we all know that a man cannot argue with someone who is stronger than he. The longer you argue, the more useless it is, and you are no better off. How can anyone know what is best for a man in this short, useless life of his, a life that passes like a shadow? How can anyone know what will happen in the world after he dies? Now let's read what Jesus had to say on the same subject. Luke's Gospel, chapter 16. Jesus said to his disciples, There was once a rich man who had a servant who managed his property. The rich man was told that the manager was wasting his master's money. So he called him in and said, What is this I hear about you? Hand in a complete account of your handling of my property because you cannot be my manager any longer. The servant said to himself, My master is going to dismiss me from my job. What shall I do? I'm not strong enough to dig ditches, and I'm ashamed to beg. Now I know what I will do. Then when my job is gone, I shall have friends who will welcome me in their homes. So he called in all the people who were in debt to his master. He asked the first one, How much do you owe my master? One hundred barrels of olive oil, he answered. Here is your account, the manager told him. Sit down and write 50. Then he asked another one, and you, how much do you owe? A thousand sacks of wheat, he answered. Here is your account, the manager told him. Write 800. As a result, the master of this dishonest manager praised him for doing such a shrewd thing because the people of this world are much more shrewd in handling their affairs than the people who belong to the light. And Jesus went on to say, And so I tell you, make friends for yourselves with worldly wealth, so that when it gives out, you will be welcomed in the eternal home. Whoever is faithful in small matters will be faithful in large ones. Whoever is dishonest in small matters will be dishonest in large ones. If then you have not been faithful in handling worldly wealth, how can you be trusted with true wealth? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to someone else, who will give you what belongs to you? No servant can be the slave of two masters. He will hate one and love the other. He will be loyal to one and despise the other. 
you cannot serve both God and money. When the Pharisees heard all this, they sneered at Jesus because they loved money. Jesus said to them, you are the ones who make yourselves look right in other people's sight, but God knows your hearts. For the things that are considered of great value by men are worth nothing in God's sight. Down to verse 19. There was once a rich man who dressed in the most expensive clothes and lived in great luxury every day. There was also a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who used to be brought to the rich man's door, hoping to eat the bits of food that fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the feast in heaven. The rich man died and was buried and in Hades, where, where he was in great pain, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus at his side. So he called out, Father Abraham, take pity on me and send Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and cool my tongue, because I'm in great pain in this fire. But Abraham said, Remember, my son, that in your lifetime you were given all the good things, while Lazarus got all the bad things. But now he is enjoying himself here while you are in pain. Besides all that, there is a deep pit lying between us, so that those who want to cross over from here to you cannot do so, nor can anyone cross over to us from where you are. The rich man said, Then I beg you, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house, where I have five brothers. Let him go and warn them so that they at least will not come to this place of pain. Abraham said, your brothers have Moses and the prophets to warn them. Your brothers should listen to what they say. The rich man answered, that is not enough, Father Abraham. But if someone were to rise from death and go to them, then they would turn from their sins. But Abraham said, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone were to rise from death. That and love seem to be the two main preoccupations of the majority of us. And I would say that mammon is probably the top religion in this country. It takes many forms. It's not just the religion of the gin and jag belt. The stock exchange may be its temple, but there are plenty of shrines around in the shape of bingo halls and betting shops. And indeed, as a nation, we are so committed to money and the things that money can buy, that I was quite shattered this week to realize that to maintain my family at its present living standard, my government in London is borrowing nearly 600 pounds per year to pay for what I demand as my right. That is incredible. It means that I and my family are going into debt at the rate of 600 pounds per annum. And that is why we're in the mess we're in. It's as simple as that. And a young teenage boy in Scotland wins half a million pounds on the pools. It was Harold Macmillan who seemed to start it all off or to give voice to what we all wanted with that famous phrase, you've never had it so good. It threw us into the 60s, grasping money and that which money can buy. It made us determined to live the good life. And we interpreted the good life in materialistic terms. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes has reached the point, the, almost the lowest point, from chapter 7 next week. It begins to climb into a more optimistic frame of mind. But it has reached the point where the writer takes a hard, cool look at the world's values he has already said there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing changes in this world of ours, and it doesn't. And he could see that the society in which he lived was devoted to the god Mammon, the god of money and that which it could buy. And that all around him were people who believed that if they could just get rich, they would be happy. And he looks very honestly at this assumption and he questions very seriously the world's values. 
Is it true that if you become rich, you become happy? We live as if it's true. We act as if it's true. None of us is prepared to let our standard of living go down. It's always got to be the other men. And though we've got to cut our national bill to the tune of 600 pounds per family, already we are getting protests at school buses being withdrawn. And that's not 600 pounds a year. That's just the beginning of what needs to be done. And so we're all determined that whoever suffers, we won't. Our trade union will see that we're all right in it and the others can go down. Our particular job, we must fight for that. If I'm middle class and self-employed, then let's fight to keep that. And if I'm paying super tax, let's fight to get that down. And so we all want everybody else to live within their means, but not ourselves. And we're going to have to become much poorer. Will we be better off if we were poorer? Or would we be worse off? That's the question which Ecclesiastes asks. And the key phrase, the key word in this passage is better. Who is better off? And as soon as you ask that, the world answers, the person with more money, the person with a bigger wage, the person who retires at 60, the person who can buy this, that, and the other, he's the one who's better off. And Ecclesiastes said, let's put a great big question mark against that. I think one of the most disturbing articles I ever read was in a magazine about three years ago in which the reporter had traced back eight people who had all won the football pools. And after some years, he went back to them. They had filled in the pools, hoping to get rich to be happy. And the reporter went back and said, you got rich, are you happy? And five out of those eight were desperately unhappy. The other three were still trying to cope with the situation. But I'm afraid it would put anyone off filling in the pools for life. It really would. Ah, but that's when you get into the half million winnings bracket. Surely we would be happier if we had enough, if we had just that much more to buy those little extras that would make so much difference to life. Would we? Who is better off in life, the man with money or the man without it? Now, there are five things that this passage says about money. And first, it talks about the disadvantages of amassing wealth. The New Testament says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That was contracted into the title of a pop song many years ago. Money is the root of all evil. That is not true. It is the love of money which is the root of all kinds of evil. And Ecclesiastes begins to describe some of them. The first is that it acts like a drug. If I'm hungry for food and I have some food, I am satisfied for the time being. If I'm thirsty and I have a drink, I'm satisfied. If I want money and I get some money, I'm unsatisfied. It's extraordinary, but it operates this way. Exactly like a drug, that the more you have, the more you need. An ancient writer once said that if you could turn the whole planet Earth into one round nugget of gold and drop it in the mouth of avarice, the mouth would just cry more loudly, give give. And money has this extraordinary effect that the more you have, the more you want. You do not become more satisfied or fulfilled. After a bit, it begins to swallow your affections, your attentions, your ambitions, until you become its slave and you're possessed by its possessions. I could take you to business tycoons. I could take you to compulsive gamblers, and I could show you the lives of men who have become slaves to that which they intended to be master of. Not only does it become an addiction, but it brings constant anxiety. Indeed, Ecclesiastes, with a rather wry smile on his face, says, a poor man may not have enough to eat, but at least he gets a good night's sleep. Ecclesiastes says, the more money you have, the more mouths you are likely to have to feed. The more retainers you will have, the more people whose wages you will have to pay, the more insurance you'll have to pay, the more responsibilities you carry, the more hangers-on. I remember a man well whose ambition it was to have a Rolls Royce. And he wasn't too ambitious. He didn't want a new one. He was content with an old one. 
But he just thought, I would just love to say I've had a Rolls Royce. And one day he appeared at work in the Rolls Royce and we all gathered around to see it. And though it was about 20 years old, nevertheless it was a Rolls. It had the magic radiator. He sold it within 12 months. And do you know why he sold it? He couldn't afford to run it. And do you know why he couldn't afford to run it? It wasn't the petrol. And it wasn't the insurance. It was because it was like driving through Africa. Everywhere he went, he was surrounded with outstretched palms. And if, if, he, if he came into the garage, there were some outstretched palms. If he pulled up at a hotel, there was somebody with an outstretched palm. And he was just so expected to tip and to tip and to tip again that he just couldn't live up to the image. And the irony was he was having to live up to his own prestige and he couldn't afford it. So he finally got rid of it, and Ecclesiastes could have told him that before. He said, you'll get a lot of hangers-on as soon as you get money. You'll find plenty of people hanging around. And when the prodigal went to the far country, he found he had plenty of friends to help him spend it. Actually, the literal Greek here does not say that the rich man stays awake worrying, but stays awake with indigestion, a kind of dyspeptic insomnia that attacks those in this condition. And the physical condition is hardly due in the Hebrew to the fact that he's got money to worry about, to the fact that he's had too much to eat. And you have the absurdity in our society that a lot of money and effort is being spent to undo the damage that money and ease have done. The health clubs and the exercise machines for those who've got too fat. It is very ironic that wealth brings some of these disadvantages. I remember being driven through the streets of Bombay not long ago, and I was horrified to see the babies lying in the gutter, sleeping. A car could so easily drive over them in the dark, for there were no street lamps. Behind them were cardboard shacks. And people were having to live there, and I said, what happens when the monsoon comes? And I was told, well, their shacks are just washed away. And then the driver taking me around said, but just study their faces for a moment. And so I did very carefully. He said, would you say those faces are happier and more contented than a London tube train full of men going to the city in the morning or not? And I looked and I had to say, I've seen more signs of stomach ulcers in the tube train in London. I've seen more tension in the faces in London. Now, please don't get me wrong and please don't go away and say that I'm justifying poverty. I'm just questioning the values of our society as Ecclesiastes does. That's all I'm doing. Because Ecclesiastes has come to the conclusion that a poor man who hasn't had enough to eat Sleeping soundly is better than a rich man suffering from indigestion. A wealthy and corpulent businessman went to his doctor about his tummy troubles. And the doctor says, I can cure this quite quickly, but it's a little drastic if you don't mind going through the cure. And the rich man said, I'll do anything. I can see I'm heading for an ulcer. And so the doctor said, invite me home to dinner. And the rich man did. And the doctor arrived with a mincing machine, which he proceeded to clamp to the dining room table. And everything the rich man ate, the doctor put through the machine into a bucket below. And at the end of the meal, he handed him the bucket and says, that's what you're expecting your tummy to cope with. And the rich man took one look and was cured. <laughs> that is behind this verse here. With affluence comes indulgence. That doesn't make us any healthier. On the contrary, it can have the very opposite effect. Very practical, the Bible, isn't it? Did you ever think there were such practical things in it? So he moves from the disadvantages of amassing wealth, which are pretty obvious, to the danger in acquiring it. Now, the danger in acquiring it is simply stated. The danger is that you lose it while you're getting it. And there are two major ways of losing your wealth. One is before you die, and what the other is when you die. And Ecclesiastes looks at both. And he looks at the tragic situation that here's a man who realizes that he's got to deal to make money. It's very rarely that you make a fortune by earning it. You usually make it by dealing. 
And he says he can be getting on so well and then make one bad deal and he's lost the lot and he's right back to where he started. And he'd seen it happen. And he said, isn't it tragic when that happens? And here's a man who's been spoiled twice in his life, once in the gaining of it and second in the losing of it. And the poor man has had all that trouble for nothing and he's right back to square one. And he really hoped he was going to pull it off this time and it had precisely the opposite effect. Of course, it can happen through no fault of the man himself. Circumstances can change. Have you read the life of the Von Trapp family? You know Maria Von Trapp, the family singers? They were one of the wealthiest families in Austria. And then in the early 1930s, the bank in which all their money was kept crashed. And overnight, they became penniless. And all that the family had worked for had gone. And this happens Sometimes it's the man's own fault and sometimes it's no fault of his at all. Circumstances just happen so that he lost all that he'd gained. And Ecclesiastes said, isn't that sad? Isn't it dangerous to acquire wealth? Because you can lose it so easily. And then he goes on to the very somber and sober truth that you lose it anyway when you die. A shroud has no pocket. Two people discussing a wealthy man's decease, and one said, how much did he leave? And the other said, everything. And this is the point at which every man becomes a pauper. We go out of life as naked as we come in. Dr. Johnson, towards the end of his life, built himself a superb villa at Twickenham. And he planted the gardens out beautifully. And he was showing the famous David Garrick round the gardens. And as he showed him round the gardens, Dr. Johnson said, these are what make a deathbed so terrible. These are what make a deathbed so terrible. And isn't it tragic that men should give themselves to something they're going to lose? They may lose it before death. They will certainly lose it at death. And yet they have made this the biggest thing in their life. All for nothing, a chasing of the wind. There is only one worse thing than the addiction that money can bring. It is the emptiness that it leaves when it's gone. The third thing that Ecclesiastes says here, and here he becomes more positive, the delight in accepting wealth. Now this may come as a bit of a surprise to you after all he's said so far. He is concerned with helping people to live with money. Those who get it. He wants to help them to come to terms with it so they remain the master and never become the servant. And he says there are two very practical things. First of all, as long as you see wealth as God's gift, you will be able to live with it. You will be able to enjoy it. If you say this is my achievement, this is my right, you will not be able to live with it. You will not be able to enjoy it. But as soon as you say, if I'm wealthy, it is because God gave me the ability to get it. And I need also the gift from him of the ability to enjoy it. And if you have some money, if you receive an inheritance, if you are given some money, then say it is God's gift and if I enjoy it, that too is his gift. Now, as soon as you say that, something else happens. As soon as you say, any money I have is God's gift, then the very next thing that you will do is to have in your heart a daily gratitude that does not rely on that gift staying with you in the future. That can enjoy having it today without worrying about losing it tomorrow. That can enjoy to the full what God has given now even if life is short and you know you're going to lose it all very soon. Now that's very sound advice. And I can tell you that I've met rich people who were not slaves of money, who did not worship mammon, who received their wealth as a gift of God and enjoyed it because God had given it and thanked God for both the gift and the ability to enjoy it. And therefore they were the sort of men who, if it were taken from them, would say with Job very simply, the Lord gave and the Lord is taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. You can't praise the Lord for the second thing unless you praise him for the first. It's only those who see everything that they've received as a gift of God who can say, blessed be the name of the Lord, when he takes it back again. It was his so it's his to do with what he likes. And if he takes it away, then hallelujah that I had it for so long. But if he takes it away, that's his business. 
And dear Job had a big argument with his wife when they went bankrupt. And his wife said, curse God and die. Look what he's done to you. And she was really very annoyed at losing all that money and all that property. And of course, she was also heartbroken at losing the family. They lost everything, that couple. They lost everything. But the difference in their attitude was the wife, she never said the Lord gave, so she couldn't bless the Lord for taking away. She saw it as that which they'd worked for, which they'd earned with the sweat of their brow. Job, you built up this business. We had the family. We made those children. We built up the farm. It was ours, and now God has taken it all away. And, and Job said, quiet woman, the Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He loaned it to us for that long. Bless him for that. And that's Ecclesiastes' advice on how to eat and drink and enjoy what you have while you have it without becoming so enslaved to it that if it were taken from you, you would feel that life had dropped out. I think there's something quite profound there, isn't there? Something very wonderful. You can apply it not just to your money. You can apply it to your children. You can apply it to your relationships. You can apply it to your career. You can apply it to everything that God gives you and say, God, thank you for it. I'll enjoy it while I have it. If you take it from me tomorrow, I'll say, blessed be the name of the Lord for giving it to me yesterday. What a different attitude. But the man who says, I got my money, it was not God's gift. It was my right. It was my wage. It was my dealing that got it. That man will say, God, why did you take it away? And he's not come to terms with God's wealth. Now, the fourth thing that is mentioned in this passage is the difficulty in appreciating wealth. One of the most cruel twists of providence is that to some people God gives wealth without giving them also the ability to enjoy it. Sometimes it is because they are physically handicapped. Sometimes they are temperamentally handicapped. Sometimes they are no good at social relationships. And, and so you find people incredibly wealthy who cannot form relationships. Men who've got everything that money can buy and nothing that it can't. And in fact, that was John D. Rockefeller's favorite phrase. The poorest man I know is the man who has nothing but money. Did you ever see the film Citizen Kane? Do you remember that film? Orson Welles, based on the life of Hearst, the newspaper millionaire. There was something tragic about that film. Here was this man who bought more and more things, who built bigger and bigger houses, finished up in a mansion, and he finished up a lonely, unhappy, miserable man. Yes, he got wealth, and it was a gift of God, but he didn't receive the gift to enjoy it. And Ecclesiastes says when you meet a man like that, you feel that it would be better to be a stillborn baby than to have lived that kind of life. To watch that happen to a man. The Ebenezer Scrooges of this world. And they can even have a poor funeral with nobody attending. One of the saddest funerals I took in this church, there were only, I think, three or four of us at the funeral service. The will of the person, when published, ran into six figures. And of the three of us at that funeral, one had never known the person, was only there because they happened to represent a body that was the chief beneficiary. Somehow there was something awfully sad. There was so much money in the situation and so few people. And Ecclesiastes says, you know, I'd rather never have been born than have wealth and not be able to enjoy it. I'd rather never have started life than go through the frustration of having all that money. Do you know who the latest is to go through this phase? Raquel Welsh. She said publicly quite recently that she now has everything she ever wanted. She's got everything money can buy. She's bought everything she ever wanted and she's no happier than when she started. She's got wealth but she can't enjoy it. So if you envy her, don't. She's to be pitied and prayed for. And Ecclesiastes reaches a very low point here and he says a stillborn baby, at least they go from oblivion to oblivion without the frustration of having money and not being able to enjoy it. And it seems as if Ecclesiastes is saying there's no more futile and frustrating experience in life than to have the money and not be able to enjoy it yourself and see strangers enjoying it because you somehow can't 
there is something in you that prevents you from enjoying it. Job and Jeremiah both had this same experience where they got to the point and wished they'd never been born and envied a stillborn child. And so we come to the fifth and final point about wealth here, and it's this. The dilemma in assessing wealth. Ecclesiastes said, I'm left with two major questions which I cannot answer within the framework of my observation. I have looked at wealth. I have seen that there is one way to live with it, and that is to accept it as a gift of God and enjoy it while you have it without being upset when you lose it. But he said, I still cannot answer two simple questions. One, who is better off? And number two, what is best? He says, I've tried to grope after the answer, who is better off? He said, I haven't, haven't a clue as to who is best off. And he says, who is better off? I don't know whether a rich man is better off or a poor man. I don't know whether a wise man is better off or a foolish man. I just do not know. He said, the only conclusion to which I've come is that it's better to be a contented man than a covetous man. That's as far as he could get. He had looked at people and he'd seen that happiness bears no relationship to a man's bank balance. None at all. What he has seen is that a man with a little who is contented is better off than a man with a lot who is not. Or as someone has said, the, the best off man, the richest man in the world is not the man who possesses much, but the man who desires little. So that's all he can say. He says, I'm sure a contented man is better than a covetous man. But he said, I still don't know what is best. And in this debate about who is better off, I haven't a clue who is best off. I know that a contented man is better off. But who's best off? And he left the question open. He said, even if I did have the answer, you can do nothing about it because life is decided by God and you can't shape your life. You may decide to make a lot of money and you may achieve that decision, but you can't decide that you will enjoy it. That's beyond your capacity to decide. So he left us with this huge question, who is best off? And his answer to that question was, God knows, God knows. And if people use that phrase, you know what they mean. They mean, I don't. No human being does. And Ecclesiastes finishes up, no human being knows who is best off. Only God knows and he's not telling. And so from that point I turn to our Lord Jesus Christ. God became man and God knows. And so I've now got someone on earth to whom I can go and say, tell me who's best off. How do you better yourself? And Jesus, God become man, he knows and he's telling. And Jesus said more about money than about any other subject. Did you ever realize that? If you go through the Bible and underline every verse of Jesus' teaching that touches on money, you will find he said more about this than about prayer, than about heaven, than about forgiveness, than about any other spiritual subject. Money, money, money. It's all the way through his teaching because it's such a big factor in life. And I want to finish by just telling you some of the things he said about it. He said this, he said, it's hard to be rich. It's tough to be rich. And you know, here he was walking through life and almost everything he used he'd borrowed. He had no home of his own. When he wanted a donkey, he had to borrow that. He was put in a borrowed tomb at the end. And he looked at life very squarely and he said to his disciples, Oh, it's hard to be rich. It's hard to have money. Very tough to live with it. And he said it on an occasion when a young man who'd really made, made a packet and found that it had not led to happiness came to him and said, Tell me, how do I find life? How do I find real life? Tell me. And Jesus said, Well, I'll give you honest advice. I think the best thing you could do is to go and get rid of your money. And then come back to me and we'll go on together. And the man stared at Jesus and his jaw dropped and he looked very unhappy. He was at a fork in the roads. Was Jesus right? He devoted every minute of his, 
an adult life up to that moment to making money because he was sure that was the way to life. And here was a man telling him he'd been on the wrong track altogether and telling him to get rid of it. And he was there at the fork in the roads and he just couldn't bring himself to say that Jesus was right. And he turned around and he walked away very sadly. And Jesus said, oh, it's tough to have money. It's so hard for men like that. And dear Simon Peter, who was always opening his mouth and putting his foot in it, came right out with his thoughts. He said, well, if people with money can't get to heaven, who can? Showing that he had the same outlook, that this is the key to everything, that this is the open sesame to life. And so Jesus had to tell him that a man's life doesn't consist in his bank balance or in the abundance of his possessions. You must never measure the importance of a life by how much money has been made during that life. That is no measure at all. What else did Jesus say? In the chapter I read, Luke chapter 16, Jesus told two stories. The first story was about a rich poor man and the second was about a poor rich man. And he said it all. Christians have real problems with the first story. It's about a thoroughly dishonest man. He was going to get the sack. He was given a few days to get the accounts ready to be presented, to be audited, and he knew they were cooked, and he knew that his days were numbered and they, that he was going to get the sack and that he was going to go. So what did he do? He fiddled even more. And he got people to rewrite the IOUs which he held in their writing, and he got them to write them down. And they were jolly grateful to him. They said, that's great. You know, I only need to pay up half what I was going to pay. Thank you so much. I'll remember you for this. And that's precisely what he was doing it for. And Jesus said he was a clever fellow. He was shrewd. I just wish, he's, says Jesus, that the children of the light were as half as shrewd as he was. Why was he shrewd? I'll tell you why he realized that life consists of relationships, not money. He realized that what you need at the last is friends, not money. And he was prepared even to fiddle the accounts to get some friends so that when he had nothing left, there would be people who'd be grateful to him. And Jesus is not commending fraud and he's not telling you to go and fiddle the books. What he is saying is, at least the man got his priorities right. He wanted friends in the future. And he said, you go away and use your money in precisely the same way. Use what God gives you to give you friends in the future. So that when you get to heaven, there'll be people who say, I'm so glad to meet you. Your money is the reason why I'm here. I'm just so glad. You see, your money you cannot take with you to heaven, but you can send a bit of it on in advance in the form of friends. You can use, said Jesus, the mammon of unrighteousness to prepare a circle of friends who will welcome you into heaven. That's called laying up treasure in heaven. In fact, Jesus' advice on investment, investment was don't lay it up on earth where you are bound to have depreciation because moth and rust consume and thieves break through and steal and you just cannot be sure of keeping it. But you lay up treasure in heaven, which means put your money where your heart is. And indeed, where your money is, there will your heart be also. And he taught people to invest wisely in that way. That's the completion of Ecclesiastes. Jesus is saying, I'll tell you who is best off. The man who finishes up with no money and lots of friends. The man who so invests what God gives him that there are people waiting in heaven saying, Oh, I just have been longing to meet you. Because the money you gave bought a Bible which brought me to the Lord. The money you spent sent a missionary to tell me about the love of Jesus. And I'm just so thrilled. Here I am. And welcome. Now that's an attitude to money. Yes, a gift of God to be enjoyed, but also to be used for an investment for eternity. It is literally true that Jesus tells you how to keep it beyond the grave how to spend it so that you don't finish up a pauper. And so he told that very disturbing story about the rich man and the poor man. 
And the poor man would love to have had the bits of food that fell. In those days, they didn't have table napkins or serviettes. They would take a piece of bread and rub their hands on it to get their hands clean. And if you've ever made pastry as a child, you know how quickly the dirt transfers from your hands to dough. And so they just rubbed their hands and then they would throw it under the table. It was the dirt from their hands rubbed on a piece of bread. And this beggar would just love to have reached out and taken that little bit of bread. But you know, as soon as they died, the rich man had a very pompous funeral, a lot of ceremony. The crowds turned out. This great man was dying. He had a great funeral. My, it was the best funeral there ever was. More flowers than there ever were. Lazarus died. There was no funeral. There's none recorded. But he found himself at a feast very quickly with Abraham. And the rich man realized what had happened. And he said, please. And here's this rich man who could buy anything he wanted and did, living in luxury, asking for someone to bring a drop of water on their finger, asking for the beggar to come with a drop of water for him. How extraordinary the reversals that take place in just the moment of death when the last become first and the first become last so often. Now, don't get me wrong, Lazarus didn't go to heaven because he was poor. He went to heaven because, as his name indicates, it means lover of God. Because though he was poor, he could have a good night's sleep. He loved God. He loved God. And there were dogs to come and lick his sores if nobody else would come and bandage them. This man loved God. So the angels carried him. Send someone to my five brothers. There they are. They're devoted to making money. They're indulging themselves. And they're going to be paupers here and begging for water. Send someone. No, they've got the Bible. Let them read it. The Bible talks about money. The Bible tells you what to do with it. The Bible tells you its dangers. The Bible tells you how to delight in wealth if God gives it to you. The Bible tells you how to bless God if he takes it away. The Bible is a book about money. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen. No, Father Abraham, if somebody should rise from the dead, they will believe. Don't you believe it, says Abraham. If someone rose from the dead, they would not alter their way of life one bit. I finish by reminding you of one of the loveliest things that was ever said about Jesus. It is this, that Jesus was fabulously wealthy, fabulously wealthy, and became poor so that we through his poverty might become rich. Did you realize how wealthy Jesus was before he was born? All the glory in heaven was his. All the universe was made for him. It all belonged to him. And he turned his back on all that and he was born in the filth of a courtyard where the animals were. And he was laid in a manger. Now that's not a very nice thing to do. And you wouldn't lay your baby in a manger where animals had been slavering over their food. And then through life he walked the roads. He had no money. When he had to pay his taxes, he had to tell Peter to go and fish for it because he hadn't got it to pay. And the early church was very much like that. They went through life saying, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give you. That was the poverty of Jesus. And yet through his poverty, we have become rich. I tell you finally about two men who lived many years ago, both English. The name of the one was Elwes and the name of the other was Cecil. Those were both the surnames. And Elwes was one of the early millionaires in England. He made a million. And it was known that Elwes used to start up out of his sleep in the middle of the night because he had suddenly remembered that he'd lost five pounds on a deal. And he would be found walking round his mansion at night. Five pounds, five pounds. How did I lose that five pounds? And he was an insomniac and he would walk around the mansion worried about a pound or two. And he was a millionaire. And a friend of his was quite poor a man called Mr. Cecil. And Mr. Cecil once wrote this in his diary towards the end of his life. When I sit with a blanket round my shoulders, huddled over my Bible on my knees, 
He said, I gloat over it as old Elwes gloats over his banknotes and his bonds. But the difference between us is this. He must leave it all behind. And I can take it with me. Isn't that lovely? And so thank you, Ecclesiastes, for questioning the values of life. For asking this question, who is better off? And for posing the question, who is best off? And thank you, Jesus, for answering that question. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for becoming poor that we might become rich. Lord, I pray that you'll remind each of us to ask ourselves how much we'll be worth five minutes after we're dead and teach us how to escape from the subtle pressures of advertising of the conversation around us. Teach us how to be free, to enjoy what you give us, and to see it as a loan, which you will one day ask back. And if you take it away, Lord, help us to say, the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken it back again. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And if, Lord, during the coming years our standard of living has to go right down, as we believe it should, then, Lord, teach us that we're better off with you. For your name's sake. Amen.